Greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Wilkerson, professor of physics at Luther College, bringing you the next in our series of what to look for in the night sky. We're talking about the week of March 10th. This time around, uh, the bad news is that moon interference doesn't get any worse than it is this week. The moon is, is really close to full all week, washing the sky out. The good news is, a full moon, you can have a total lunar eclipse. And for those of us in North America, we sure do this week. So on the morning of March 14th, about 1.30 local time for me, that's central, uh, central time uh, for me here in Iowa, the moon is going to go into total eclipse and come out at about 2.30. Uh, it will be in some form of eclipse much longer than that. So you'll have a chance to see it uh, head into eclipse earlier than that, head out of eclipse later than that. So much of the night, but not, not when it first gets dark, but after it's been dark for a few hours, you'll start to see uh, some effect uh, of lunar eclipse that night. So we've got a, a lunar eclipse that's just about as well positioned for North America as it can get. Okay, so that's the good news. The bad news is we got a lot of moon on the 11th into the 12th. So the evening of the 11th into the morning of the 12th, a 95% full moon. So an almost full moon passes within about one and a half degrees of Regulus, the bright star in the base of the backward question mark, the sickle shape of Leo. And that's, um, so that 95% full moon is headed toward a full moon on the 14th. Coming out of the full moon, it's still 95% full on the evening of the 15th into the 16th. You see just how full the moon is all week. And it, it approaches Spica. So for me, again, here in the central part of the United States, uh, as it approaches Spica, the bright star in Virgo, uh, below the other end of Leo, below, below, De, below Dana Bola, that marks the triangle tail of Leo, uh, it's, uh, we're approaching Spica. It'll get to within about five degrees of Spica before it gets to be too light to see this for me. A little further west, you'll get to see uh, the, the moon approach Spica more closely. Okay, so that's what we got moon-wise this week. Uh, what's also going on, we, we've lost our planets a little bit. Uh, there's been this big hype, uh, I call it, this big hype about the parade of planets. And those of you who have been watching these uh, little, little short films for a little while, you know that we've been hyping the planets. We've been thinking about the planets for a long time. And I think it was actually probably a little bit earlier in the year. Uh, if we wanted to observe the planets, we had better observing. But now we're losing Venus and Saturn and Mercury. And all these things are, are disappearing into the sun. And we're starting to have a, a little, a fewer planets to observe right now. But Mars this week, Mars and Jupiter are still well placed in the night sky for observation. And Mars grazes is, is, is what I wrote on the board. Uh, you know, you can define grazing however you want. Uh, Mars grazes 57 Geminorium. 57 Geminorium is a fifth magnitude star. That's going to be right at the limit of what most of us could see under dark skies. If it's really dark, we could probably see down to, to, if you have really dry, dark skies, you might be able to see down closer to sixth magnitude. Uh, and if you have any light pollution at all, it's probably more like fourth magnitude. So uh, the fifth magnitude is right at the limit. A tenth of a degree, remember your finger at arm's length is one degree. So that's pretty close uh, that it slides by. It goes from the evening of the 14th to the evening of the 16th. The evening of the 15th into the morning of the 16th, that's when it's going to be the closest in there uh, to watch Mars slide past there. Binoculars will help you out with that because the star is faint enough. Mars is enough brighter. Even if you have good dark skies, it's going to be hard to see uh, the, the, the fainter 57 Geminorium next to bright Mars like that. So that's what we got. Um, we got all of this going on with the moon and the planets. Now, one of the things we do, we like to think about double stars or binary stars. I particularly like binary stars that we talk about. Uh, double stars, the difference being it's a chance alignment. One star is much closer, one star is much further away, but they make a nice pair. They're pretty stars next to each other on the sky. Still fun to look at. Binary stars are actually orbiting the center of mass of the system. They're actually orbiting each other. And so I like to think about those. But let's think about Orion. Orion is setting, so as it gets dark, Orion will be past the meridian and on its way towards setting each night this week. Um, but it's still pretty high in the sky and pretty well placed for observing uh, all throughout the, the, the month of March here. So it's not too bad. Um, we'll start to lose it as we get deeper into March a little bit because it starts to stay light later. Uh, but in any event, we've got the three stars that mark the belt of Orion. And you've got big, bright uh, Betelgeuse and safe, the other leg star. You've got uh, big, bright Rigel, safe. Betelgeuse is a shoulder star and Bellatrix is the other shoulder star. Uh, that, that you see as the bright pattern 
Uh, I wrote so much on the board, you may have a hard time seeing the bright pattern uh, around it. But I want to think about some double stars and particularly binary stars in here. But what it turns out with all of these stars in Orion, these stars are clumped together. They're almost like, they're multiple star systems, almost like little star clusters in a lot of places. Let's start with Rigel. Rigel is a big, bright, white, white, blue leg star that we see right there. 0 0.1 magnitude. Remember, the system counts backwards. Zero is a really bright star. So this is one of the very brightest stars in all of the sky. It has a seventh magnitude companion. So it has a star, if you have a small telescope, uh, this is the brightest star in the sky that you can see a companion with with a small telescope, but it's actually hard. Even those nine arc seconds, remember, an arc minute is a 60th of a degree. An arc second is a 60th of an arc minute. So nine arc seconds in most telescopes under most observing conditions is pretty easy to separate. But the seventh magnitude star is so much fainter than the 0 0.1 magnitude star. That fainter star tends to get lost in the glow of the brighter star. So it helps to have a, a slightly bigger telescope, a three or four inch, a six inch diameter, even an eight inch diameter telescope, and to have good, clean observing conditions. So good, uh, steady skies really helps you out here. Uh, the, the, the companion, the seventh magnitude star, is a spectroscopic binary. We've talked a lot about spectroscopic binaries where you see the dark lines in the spectra of two different stars in there, and the Doppler shift. As one star moves toward you, it gets to be uh, blue shifted. You have a shorter wavelength for that line, and the other line gets to be longer wavelength, and they, they switch around. So you see the two lines switching back and forth in the spectrum like that. Uh, this is a spectroscopic binary with a period of 9.9 .9 days there. Uh, let's go up to uh, the star that marks the head. So here's our shoulder stars in Orion. There was our leg stars, Bellatrix and Betelgeuse, the shoulder stars. Maisa uh, Lambda, Orionis, is a 3.5. Nice bright star, should be able to see it, no problem. Uh, star that's above, that would mark sort of the head of Orion. And that sits above here, brightest star in that region. It forms a triangle uh, in the sky. So when you look at this, you'll see a triangle of stars there with phi 1 and phi 2, uh, this star. This is a 3.5 magnitude star. It has a 5.5 magnitude companion, 4.4 arc seconds away. The, this is a much easier binary star to split than is Rigel. Uh, because the two components aren't so vastly different in brightness. Uh, every step in magnitude is a step of uh, 2.5 in brightness. So five magnitudes is a factor of 100 in brightness. So the companion of the companion is, uh, 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 of Rigel is 600 times fainter than, than Rigel is. That's a big difference. This is not nearly as much. Two magnitudes is still a lot. It's still six times fainter uh, by the companion, but easy, easier to split. A good one to do. You got your small telescope out to go after that. Let's go down here to Delta, Mintaka. So the three stars of the belt. So we're learning the stars of Orion. We think about the belt stars, the leg stars, and the shoulder stars. We don't always call them by name. Uh, you've got Mintaka is the westernmost star. The one in the middle, middle is Alnalam, and Alnitak is the other star. So Mintaka, Delta Orionis, is a, a, is, a, is a binary star in there that you can pull out as well. And so go give that a try to see what you find. In fact, all of these are binary stars that you might be able to pull out. All three of these across here, Alnitak, Alnalam, and Mintaka. So give all of those a try and see what you see uh, in there. Uh, we can also look at Sigma Orionis. Let's do, yeah, let's do Sigma. Uh, Sigma Orionis down here. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. So if you put, plucked all three of these stars to see which ones you see as binary stars and which ones you don't see as binary stars. And then you drop below al -Natak, just really close to al -Natak. You come across Sigma, a fourth magnitude star down in there. Pretty easy to see. Uh, you, it, it just just drop straight below there, the brightest star you're going to come to just below Al Natak. And the primary star in there is a 4.2 magnitude and a 5.1 magnitude star, separated by a quarter of an arc second. You're not going to be able to pull those apart. Those are going to you're not going to see those as separate stars in your backyard. Uh, so, but you've got a bunch of other stars in the region. This is like a little star cluster. Like I said, you get these things that are. This is part of a little star cluster, part of a little star cluster, and you've got. Uh, one star that's 8.8 .8 magnitude, so a nice faint star uh, that's 11 arc seconds away from, from the primary star. 13 arc seconds away is a 6.6 .6 magnitude star and a 6.7 magnitude star, 41 arc seconds away. So you've got a nice group of stars. You've got a, a bunch of stars there together, a multiple star system 
uh, that makes up sigma there. And then let's do theta. Uh, we didn't want, we, we picked, had to pick and choose. There's all of these. We decided to just blow through the stars in the belt. Um, we, we don't want to talk forever about all of these, but Theta Orionis is an interesting star system because it's co usually called the trapezium. And the trapezium are these four big, bright, young stars. Again, part of a cluster of stars, really, uh, but big, bright, young stars that are in the heart of the Orion Nebula, M32. So, uh, 42. M42 is this fuzzy patch, often, often the sword of Orion uh, below his belt right there. It is this star birth region, beautiful nebula. Go ahead and give it a try with your telescope. Look at it, but it's going to be washed out a lot this week by the, the, the moon that we have. But you can still see the stars down in the core. So you look at the core, and you can see the four bright stars that are shining in there in the trapezium. They're in a region that's about 22 arc seconds across. So you got about uh, a third of an arc minute across, and you have four, four stars that look fairly bright in your telescope. A fifth magnitude star, a couple that are about 6.7 magnitude, and an 8.1 magnitude star uh, that form the trapezium. So see if you can break that apart. Interesting view right in the heart of the Orion Nebula. And I think that's enough. Again, we could talk. There are others. There are a few other interesting multiple star systems in Orion, and we could have talked more about each of these three, but we decided to skip right on through there. So you've got uh, the event of the week is the total lunar eclipse. And so you've got the total lunar eclipse on, uh, on March 14th in the morning, and you've got Mars skimming by 57 Geminorum. That's going to be my event of the week. So one I'm going to pick to pay attention to most is watching Mars catch. Uh, it, it's back in prograde motion. I'm going to watch it move toward 57 Geminorum and pass it uh, later in the week. So that's the one I'm looking most forward to. And then you've got the moon pairing with a, a couple of bright stars. Lots and lots of stars to pay attention to in Orion. So we just picked out a handful of them for you to think about. Maybe we'll do more. Probably not. We're probably done with Orion for this season. It'll be next October uh, before we, we pick that back up. So that's what we got. Uh, we hope you have a great week, everyone. Enjoy the sky. Have some good observing. And as always, thanks for watching.